Hello to my friends who are joining us via recording. Today is April 24th. We are continuing our work on the special senses, particularly the senses of hearing, balance, taste, and smell. So let's go ahead and start with our image of how the process of hearing works, just to remind ourselves. Remember that the process of hearing is done by your ear. The ear has three parts to it. So let me get out my little marker here. We have this first part. That's the part that's found on the outside of you. For my friends here in the chat, what do I call the part of your ear that's on the outside? It's not a trick question, I promise. What's the outside part of your ear called out here? Or the, the structures that are in this outer region? Any guesses? I'll, I'll guide us, I'll get us there. We have three parts of the ear. We have the external ear, the middle ear, and the internal ear. Not a trick question. Which of those regions is on the outside? External, middle, or internal? Which of those means outside? Yeah, a couple of us are chiming in. It, I promise it's not a trick question. It's the external part of the ear, the external ear. When we talk about the external ear, the outside part of the ear, the job of this part of the ear is to collect sound waves, collect sound waves. This includes a couple of things that, that we mentioned in the chat. It includes the big part of your ear that you can see on you. We can't see it in the picture, but the big part of your ear on the outside called the auricle that collects sound waves. What we're looking at right here is one of those bone markings that we learned for lab this semester called the external acoustic meatus. It's another little tube that collects those sound waves. So the external ear includes these structures the very edge of the external ear is called the tympanic membrane. This is my dividing line between the external ear and the middle ear. The middle ear region is, is what I see right here in the picture. Remember that the big thing in the middle ear are these structures called ossicles. Ossicles are the smallest bones in the body. Uh, so ossicles are the first ossicles attached to this tympanic membrane, this, this drum membrane, essentially. So this, this um, ossicle called the malleus, which means a mallet or a hammer, it beats against the tympanic membrane, which causes its neighbor, the incus, to start beating back and forth, which causes the last one here, the stapes, to vibrate back and forth. Right next to the stapes, it's sitting on top of another membrane, like the tympanic membrane, and that membrane is called the oval window. And I think we mentioned this on Wednesday, but the oval window is definitely an underlying highlight star structure. Like, we got to know this guy here. Because the oval window is when I take my sound waves that were here in the middle ear and actually get them into the internal ear region. So my big region inside here is called the internal ear. And the internal ear is where we actually perceive sounds, perceive sounds. Not all parts of the internal ear perceive sounds. Let me mark, mark things here. We got number one, scalar vestibuli. Number two, cochlear duct. Number three, scala tympani. Which of those three locations Number one, number two, number three. Where do I actually perceive sound waves? Which one has the cells that can hear sound? Does anyone remember? Yeah, a couple of us are, are, are chiming in for me. I've got three fluid-filled tubes. They don't all hear sounds. The only one that can hear sounds is the cochlear duct, is, is tube number two here in the middle. So the cochlear duct here in the middle, this, this tube doesn't get sound waves at the beginning when they first come into the internal ear. That Where the sound waves go when I first get them to the internal ear is my top layer up here called scala vestibuli. So scala vestibuli, my sound waves come in. Remember that this was a tube that was filled with fluid. So now my sound waves are moving through fluid, 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 until they find the particular place in the cochlear duct where they can be heard. 
when they can be heard there, they'll, they'll vibrate into the cochlear duct. They'll activate those hair cells that we talked about on, on Wednesday. And once I've activated the hair cells and heard that song, remember or the sound, I guess we're, we're thinking in terms of songs this morning. Uh, once I've heard that sound, then my sound waves get transferred into number three here, scala timpani. Scala timpani, remember the way I jokingly talked about it, this is where the sounds go to die. So you hear them once and you don't want to keep hearing them over and over again. Um, I'll send them into this bottom fluid filled tube where they vibrate all the way out to the structure called the round window. This would be another one for us to make sure we're familiar with. The round window, think about it like a garbage disposal. It's gonna chop up any of those sound waves that get to it. We're no longer going to hear those sound waves once they go out the round window. Exactly, Pilar is totally right. She said there's no bones found here. Yep, since there's nothing here to catch the sound waves when they bounce out of the round window, those those sound waves are gone. I can't hear them anymore. So round window is, is my recycling or my garbage disposal. The oval window is the entry into the internal ear. So make sure we know the difference between the two of those. We talked about on Wednesday the two types of fluid that are found inside these tubes. So my first fluid was called perilymph fluid. I see perilymph fluid inside the two tubes that are not doing hearing. So scala vestibuli, the first tube that sound waves go into, that's got perilymph fluid. Scala tympani, the, the tube that they go in to die, that also has perilymph fluid. And here in the middle, in the cochlear duct, we have the special kind of fluid called endolymph fluid. Let's see if we can remember from uh, our discussion on Wednesday. Remember, endolymph fluid has a lot of two particular cations, two things with a positive charge. Do you remember what those two things were that endolymph has a lot of? Endolymph has a lot of, yeah, so the first thing it has a lot of is potassium, potassium, K plus. We talked about how the goal of potassium, that's an endolymph fluid, uh, is, is to help us to depolarize my hair cells. So which it uses to depolarize hair cells. Normally in a neuron, we would be using sodium to depolarize our cells. But because we're doing special senses, they do things a little bit differently. So for my hair cells, which are the cells that live inside my cochlear duct that actually hear for me, uh, we're gonna depolarize those with potassium because I have so much potassium floating around out here. But the other thing that a couple of us mentioned, um, endolymph also has a lot of calcium, calcium. Oops. When I talk about calcium, what was the reason it was good that, that I had a lot of calcium in this fluid? Does anyone remember what I do with that calcium? Yeah, so that, that calcium, which it uses to help release neurotransmitters, neurotransmitters. At least with the calcium, my function of calcium is not different than in a neuron. Remember, we always brought in calcium. Let's draw my favorite graph, right? Here's my favorite graph. Up and down. What happens to the membrane charge on a neuron, right? So when I, when I talk about the point where calcium is used in this process, it's the very top of this peak up here. This is where calcium is, is brought into a neuron. The only job of that calcium was to help me spit out neurotransmitters. When calcium comes in, those neurotransmitters go out and allow a neuron to talk to its neighbor. It's the same deal here with my hair cells. When calcium rushes into these hair cells, that allows them to spit out neurotransmitters and allows them to speak to their nerve down here. Notice, I, I mentioned this briefly last time, You'll see on my pictures, when we talk about hearing, it talks about the cochlear nerve. 
when we talk about balance, it's going to talk about the vestibular nerve. We learned those two nerves together, right? The, the name that we learned for lab was vestibulocochlear. Vestibulocochlear. The vestibulocochlear nerve, hopefully we remember this here. What number was the vestibulocochlear nerve? That was cranial nerve number... Man, we're feeling shy in the chat this morning. Well, one person helped me out. She was right. Yeah, it's, it's cranial nerve number eight. Cranial nerve number eight. There's my Roman numerals for it. When we talk about hearing and balance, both of those are going to go here through cranial nerve number eight. Cranial nerve number eight. So here's part of, of cranial nerve number eight, the cochlear part, the hearing part. The vestibular part we're going to talk about here in just a bit when we talk about balance. I feel like we need to wake up, wake up our fingers here. We need to, to have a little dance party really fast. In the chat, help me out. I want to, want to get our vibe a little bit happier here. Send me an emoji. It can be a dance party. It can be a thumbs up. It can be a thumbs down. It could be a crying face. Where are we at this morning? Because we're, we're not chatting too much. I think we're afraid of each other. I promise we don't bite. <coughs> at least I think. We're at a distance. Okay. Yeah, we got some mixed emotions. I can relate to that. <laughs> No other takers on emojis. Man, tough crowd. Okay, we got the coffee. Coffee coming. Yep. Ariel's listening. Perfect. Or is that a, yeah, that's an ear. I was like, is that an ear or a sideways skull? You might be an anatomy teacher when you're like, are we looking at a, a mid-sagittal section of the skull there? Some of us maybe are browsing the emojis to see what our options are. I always like this one. No, it's fine, Pilar. I, I don't expect you to have the lecture done. Did it? Okay, here we go. Here's the one that I always like. I send that in my text messages a lot. I feel like the state of the world right now is just a whole lot of throwing your hands up in the air and like, whatever. <laughs> okay, well, I got I got a few more of us. Hey, there we go. The, we, got, we got the mask going on. Yep. I got a few more of us to, to chat in. Please feel free to send me the wrong answers in the chat too. I promise there's no judgment. So um, if you ever just want to send me an emoji just because, like, feel free to do that too. So um, I promise I don't bite. I can't vouch for your neighbors, although they're more than six feet away from you, so they shouldn't be able to bite you. But um, we'll, we'll try to make it through together, right? It's Friday. It's almost the weekend. We're so close. Okay, so the cells that do hearing... Another very important thing for us to know, hair cells. There's two types of hair cells. I'm not going to require you to know the difference between them. Uh, just know that the type of cells that detect hearing are those hair cells. They live on top of something called the basilar membrane or the basement membrane. That's at the bottom of the cochlear duct. Um, when sound waves come into the cochlear duct, it's this membrane that starts moving, the basilar membrane. And it makes these little hair cells bounce up and down. And when they bounce up and down, they hit the ceiling of their little tent, the tectorial membrane. That's the ceiling. The tectorial membrane doesn't move. Since it doesn't move, it bends our hair cells. And that's what's going to help us actually hear things. So here's the last thing that, that we looked at during office hours on Wednesday. We looked up close and personal at a hair cell. Remember up here at the top of the hair cell, all of these little things up here were called hairs. We've got little hairs up here. Those hairs are covered in mechanically gated potassium channels. And remember we talked about how mechanically gated means we have to push them open. So what's going to push them open is that tectorial membrane. When they bounce up and hit it, they open up and they let in that potassium we were talking about. So they let in the potassium, and you can see right here in my picture, that depolarizes their membrane. That makes them go positive. When they go positive, we open up voltage-gated calcium channels. 
my voltage gated calcium channels bring in that calcium. And remember the job of calcium is to make those neurotransmitters leave. So this is how the process of hearing works on, on a chemical level. We have that potassium that comes in, that depolarizes the membrane, leads to calcium coming in, which leads to spitting out neurotransmitters. One of the big ideas that I told you guys in the notes, something to think about as we think about the process of hearing, of the process of balance, um, for, for these processes that we talk about here with our hair cells, um, the process of hearing comes down to the rate that neurotransmitters are released the rate that neurotransmitters are released. This would be an underlying highlight star idea for you to write for yourself in your notes. The way that you interpret whether you are hearing something right now, whether you're listening for something and you're not hearing something, or whether you just stopped hearing something. It's all about the rate of neurotransmitters that the neurons are releasing. Because neurotransmitters, th this neuron or this hair cell that I'm looking at right here, it's the same hair cell, by the way, that I'm looking at right here, and it's the same one that I see over on this side. This, neuro, this, this hair cell can only ever release one kind of neurotransmitter. Um, I, I should look this up so I could tell you sometime, but let's, let's pretend for the sake of, of our class here that the only neurotransmitter that this hair cell can release is acetylcholine. We'll say it's acetylcholine. So there's ACH. I can only ever release one message, acetylcholine. Well, if I can only ever send one message, it's kind of like with Morse code, where you can only send one sound, right, one ping. So we have to come up with a special rate or special ways to distinguish between the letters. That's exactly what's going on right here with our hair cells. So we're doing our Morse code here. Am I sending just a few messages like I see right here? Am I sending a ton of messages like I see right here? Am I sending no messages? We got some Morse code going on between your hair cells and your neurons to help you know um, if you're hearing anything. So let's start here on the left side of my picture. The left side of my picture says the basilar membrane is at rest. Now, let me make a, a type a little thing for you so you don't have to type it all out. Number one cochlear duct. Number two, scala tympani. Number three, scala vestibuli. Let's use the picture in our notes. Which of these three tubes inside your ear has the hair cells? Which of those three tubes has the hair cells or would be the location that has the basilar membrane. Do we remember which tube had the basilar membrane in the bottom of it? Tube number one, number two, number three. Ariel's guessing number two. Ariel is, is close. The Basilar membrane, it's, it's actually my, my basement membrane, my bottom membrane that I find in the cochlear duct. So the cochlear duct um, is the place where I actually hear. The basilar membrane makes up the bottom of that cochlear duct. Okay, I'm going to lose my notes, but we'll, we'll come back to it. Here we go. Here's inside the ear. Remember, we got the three tubes here. So three tubes inside the ear. We've got the top tube called scala vestibuli. We've got the middle tube called the cochlear duct. We've got the bottom tube called scala tympani. The membrane that divides up the cochlear duct from scala tympani, that's called the basilar membrane. That's called the, the basement membrane of the cochlear duct. So when we're talking about where the basilar membrane's found, um, where it's going to be bouncing up and down, it bounces up and down inside the cochlear duct. Because inside the cochlear duct is where these little hair cells live. So the hair cells and the basilar membrane 
and the other membrane, the thing that lives on top of them, all of those are found inside the cochlear duct, that middle tube there. So let's go back to our picture. I'm looking at my hair cells. My hair cells have above them the tectorial membrane. That's the one that doesn't move. <coughs> they have below them the basilar membrane. And the basilar membrane is the one that does move when I start hearing sound waves. So I'm inside the cochlear duct. My basilar membrane is at rest. And what I mean by that is it means I'm not currently perceiving a sound from the environment. So when things are quiet, when I'm not particularly hearing something, this is what it looks like. The basilar membrane is straight across. The hair cell is sitting straight up on top of it. And it's just barely touching my tectorial membrane up here at the top. This is what happens when you're not hearing a sound. So a, a good note to make for yourself, not hearing sound. This is what it looks like. We're not hearing something. When I'm not hearing something, the very top of my hairs, on my, my hair cells, the very top is just, like I said, just barely touching the tectorial membrane, which as we can see on our description here means a few of my ion channels are open up. Just a few of them. I can kind of see it right here. Here's the one they're showing that's opened up. Just a few of my channels open up. Now, with hair cells, it's a little bit different than what we talked about with a neuron, where we said that, that the only way a neuron can release any messages is if it gets all the way depolarized. Hair cells are a special case. If I bring in just a little bit of potassium, if I'm just slightly depolarized, I can actually open up a few of my calcium channels and I can bring a little bit of calcium, just enough calcium to make me spit out a small number of neurotransmitters. So notice when I have just a little bit of potassium coming in, I spit out just a little bit of neurotransmitters. Those little bit of neurotransmitters that I, that I spit out are enough to activate the cochlear nerve just a little bit. The way I described it in, in your guided lesson was think about kind of like a submarine that uses sonar. So it sends out little pings into the environment to figure out what's going on around it. So um, when I'm not hearing anything, a few neurotransmitters are released. A few neurotransmitters are released. The reason I spit out a few of them is because the very top, my tallest hair, is just barely touching that tectorial membrane, which means that just a few of my ion channels are open. I bring in a little bit of that cation, which makes me spit out a little bit of my neurotransmitters. So what message is the neuron hearing? Um, a, so, so it's basically what it's hearing is we're listening for something, I haven't heard something in particular. Um, <clears throat> it, it's important that we know that we are spitting out a couple of neurotransmitters because when we get all the way over here, notice on this last picture, we actually don't spit out any neurotransmitters. So when you think about what message is it that this, that this neuron is hearing, uh, I, I kind of like to think about it. The message it's hearing is I'm listening, but I don't hear anything at the moment. Um, so it, it, it's saying we're still listening, it's not that we just stopped hearing a sound, it's that I haven't heard anything yet. Um, so think about this message as we haven't heard anything yet, but we're, we're waiting. My second pane here in the picture says that my hairs are bent toward the tallest stereocilium. This stereocilium word here, that's the fancy anatomy word for hairs. So basically what we're saying is my hairs are bent toward this tallest one that's up here. This stage where my, my hair cells are, are balanced and look kind of like this, this is what it looks like when, it, when we're hearing a sound, when we're hearing something. Or, or maybe, let's, let's change that word hearing, when we're perceiving a sound. Remember, perceiving is the word that, that we've been using to describe when you actually start to process something. So when you're actually processing a sound, here's my hair cell right here. This is what it looks like when I'm actually processing a sound wave. The way I know that I'm receiving a sound wave is because check out my basilar membrane down here. See how it's tilted? 
it's tilted this way because sound waves just came into the cochlear duct. And when they came into the cochlear duct, they caused this basilar membrane to start bouncing. So it's bouncing up and down. When it bounces up and down, it pushes those hair cells right into the tectorial membrane, which cannot move. When it pushes them into that tectorial membrane, notice now that all of my mechanically gated potassium channels open up. So all of them open up, my membrane gets completely depolarized. As I completely depolarize my membrane, I bring in a ton of calcium. Now they show us that calcium. I bring in a ton of calcium, which means I spit out a ton of neurotransmitters. All of those neurotransmitters go down to my nerve and look at the number of messages that that nerve is receiving. Each of those neurotransmitters causes it to go through our, our spike in, in membrane charge. So all of these are little action potentials. All of these are little messages that this neuron is receiving. When this neuron receives this many messages, this is the, the message that it's receiving is we're hearing something. We're hearing something. When my hair cell spits out a ton of neurotransmitters, we're hearing something. We're making, we're making it happen. The reason I'm spitting out so many neurotransmitters, the reason that we're hearing something is because we bumped into the tectorial membrane in the top. We have one more scenario to look at, and that's this one over here on the right. And on this particular scenario, notice that my basilar membrane is tilted the other direction. The way that, that they describe the scenarios were bent away from that tallest hair. This scenario, what we see with our, our picture over here, this is what happens when, when we're done hearing a sound. Remember, we want to hear sounds once. We want to perceive them when they bounce through, and then we want to get rid of them. We want those sounds to go away and die, right? This is, is what it looks like when those sounds are, are going away and dying. They went from being bouncing around inside the cochlear duct, so my membranes bounce up, to now bouncing around in scalopony. When I'm getting rid of those sound waves and sending them here to the bottom to, to run them out of town, my membrane bends the other direction. And when my membrane bends the other direction, we actually uh, close our mechanically gated channels. We bend them the other way, we kind of slam them shut. So if I slam those, those channels shut, <clears throat> if I've closed them, no more potassium coming inside, which means that no more calcium is coming inside. And if calcium doesn't come inside, I'm definitely not releasing any neurotransmitters. So literally, if you look underneath this cell, <clears throat> excuse me, there are no neurotransmitters being released. The reason I need a phase where I'm releasing no neurotransmitters is that's going to tell my, tell my neuron, we just finished hearing a sound. We just finished hearing a sound. Because my neuron just got a ton of messages here in the middle when I heard a sound. We want that neuron to know, okay, we're done hearing things, specifically the thing we just heard, it's done, before we go back to saying, okay, I'm listening, um, I, I might hear something. We, we need to have a different state or a different way of, of representing that. So I have a very short period here while I'm, I'm sending those sound waves out to recycling where there's no neurotransmitters released at all. This nerve completely shuts off, it's not hearing anything, and when that gets to your brain, your brain says, okay, I got this. We're not hearing any messages at all. That means that we're done hearing our sound. <coughs> Swear, guys, I'm not, I don't have COVID-19. I've had a sinus infection for like two weeks. And today is like the annoying, okay, fine, we'll leave you, but we'll make you cough all day. So <laughs> sorry for all the coughs today. Uh, so what message is the neuron hearing? Yeah, this is where, where it would be none. This is where the neuron says, oh, I'm not hearing anything at all. And keep in mind, the neuron was just hearing a ton of messages. So think about this as the cutoff. Like I'd been hearing screaming, hearing screaming for a long time, um, but then that screaming stopped. Okay, we're done finally hearing that sound. And now then we go back over here where I'm releasing a few little neurotransmitters and, and it gets back to normal. 
Um, so I'm reading the, the comment here from Letty that thinks this looks like a foot and the basilar membrane is the heel. How many neurotransmitters are being released with the big toe always on guard and the heel is always on guard for a blister? I could possibly see that. Yeah, so we got the big toe up here, right? So big toe down to the little. Yeah, so this big toe up here is the one that's always touching that tectorial membrane. So um, we're, we're listening for the messages or the little blisters that are coming out of this foot here. So yeah, if we're, if we're feeling all the pain, all blisters, right? That's because this big toe was slammed against the tectorial membrane. Um, if we're, we're not hearing any messages, if there's no blisters, it's because I bent my toes the other direction. So they're, they're not rubbing on the back of, of my heel. Um, otherwise, my shoe is maybe fitting just barely just right. I don't know. I guess that, that's the one place where it's a little challenging, right? There's just the right amount of rubbing, I guess. So, yeah. So whatever helps you to, to memorize um, how many neurotransmitters we spit out, how many blisters we're getting. Sure, I love it. So, are the hair cells not bent when you're finished hearing a sound? Um, it's not that they're not bent, it's actually that they're bent the other direction. Um, so, like a gate in a backyard, you can push it open and you can also push it closed. Um, so, if you notice on my picture up here, they're actually pushed the opposite direction, they're being pushed closed. So I, I'm no longer pushing them open the way that I did here um, when I was perceiving the sound. So really there, there's two options. Either I'm pushing closed, um, like I see over here, when I just finished hearing a sound, or I'm pushing them open to some extent. A lot when I hear a sound, or just a little bit when they're, they're in their normal state. Um, but this is kind of like we're slamming the gate shut. We're making sure they don't open over here. So I never really have a state where they're completely not being pushed on because this tectorial membrane lives right here next to that big tallest hair. It's always pushing on them. Yeah. My husband stole my tissue box from me earlier this morning. Give me just a minute to go grab my tissues. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I didn't get any questions in the chat related to this. If we're feeling okay, give me a thumbs up. Or if you have a question, go ahead and type it now. I'll put our little note that we started with at the top. Um, we said that the process of hearing comes down to the rate that neurotransmitters transmitters are released there's our make sure we remember um yeah we got a it's pilar mentioned hey we got a little toothbrush going on down here that's right we got we got all kinds of things going on in our picture right i like it little toothbrush with all the messages in the world saying we're hearing something so there we go okay so big idea with hearing this thing that i typed up here that we said before it's all about the rate of neurotransmitter release are we spitting them out really fast because we're hearing something? Are we not spitting out any because we just finished hearing something? Or are we spitting out just a few because we're listening, we're waiting, we just haven't heard anything yet? Hey, by the way, let's do, do a correlation here to unit three. Remember when we were talking about the reticular activating system in unit three? The reticular activating system, RAS, what does the reticular activating system do for you? What's the job of RAS in your brain? What does RAS do, reticular activating system? Yeah, it keeps you alert, right? Um, this is the system that we said was malfunctioning when you're in a coma, so it keeps you conscious. Um, 
Remember how we said that the reticular activating system is always sending little pings to the brain to tell the brain, I, I need to stay awake and I need to be listening for something. Well, here's those little pings right here. See those little pings right here? So we said one of the types of input that fed into the reticular activating system was auditory impulses. That's where we got the, the smoke detectors, right, that make angry noises. Well, here's those little pings that we're constantly sending back to the brain, telling the brain we're listening for something. I haven't heard anything yet, but I'm listening. So here's a tie in to the reticular activating system. The reason why we send out little messages is to keep you ready for when we get the big message. When we get all the neurotransmitters spit out at once. So little little unit three review for us there. Yeah, fascinating. Good. I'm glad that somebody else finds that nerd moment enjoyable. <laughs> that nerd moment brought to you by Dr. Alice. <clears throat> OK, so what we just talked about was the process of hearing. Please make sure that we know that the process of, of hearing occurs in the part of the internal ear called the cochlea. The cochlea only does hearing. It does not do anything related to equilibrium, related to balance. The parts of the internal ear that do balance, let me train, change colors on us here, are places called the saccule, the utricle, and then all of these three things right here called the semicircular canals. So we have three parts in the internal ear that do balance. I'll do the fancy word here, equilibrium. Those three parts, in the order we'll talk about them, the saccule, who can't spell, saccule, utricle, and semicircular canals. The saccule and the utricle help us with something that we call static equilibrium. This is the kind of equilibrium that helps you to know if you're falling forward or falling backwards. Static equilibrium. The semicircular canals are involved in rotational equilibrium. And just like its name suggests, that's when we're going in a circle, when we're rotating. So uh, the, the three structures that are involved in, in balance or in equilibrium I'll type those words for us. They're in your notes packets. Static equilibrium. I'm not going to type that whole word. I'm just feeling lazy. And the semicircular canals are involved in dynamic equilibrium. This is when I'm telling you guys, I wish that we were able to do special senses in, uh, in lab because we have some great models. I mean, I wish we were able to do the entire lab thing in lab, right? Uh, but we have some great models that show this, and you can do a Google search and get some really awesome 3D renderings um, of, of what the, the internal ear looks like. Dynamic equilibrium uh, and rotational equilibrium are the same. That's correct. The technical name for uh, what you might call rotational equilibrium, it's technically called dynamic equilibrium. So for studying purposes, um, make sure we know that word dynamic, meaning that it, it is rotational. Static equilibrium means that it's relative to gravity. So that's kind of forwards and backwards. Dynamic equilibrium is, is when we're rotating, kind of in a circle. Yeah, so we'll add those notes here. Dynamic equilibrium, rotational, rotational equilibrium versus static equilibrium that is relative to gravity, relative to gravity. So in parentheses, forward and backward. That's maybe the best way to think about it, forward and backward. Two types of, of equilibrium. By the way, I'll mention for you cranial nerve number eight making an appearance again. Now we're talking about, remember cranial nerve number eight has that big long name, vestibulocochlear nerve, vestibulocochlear nerve. When we talked about the cochlear part of this nerve, what did the cochlear part, what kind of information did the cochlear part of this nerve collect? Does anyone remember? The cochlear part of the vestibulocochlear nerve. What special sense did we just finish talking about?
Yeah, we're in the ear. Both of them are in the ear. Yeah, the cochlear part was collecting stuff from the cochlea. The cochlea is the part of your ear that does hearing. The part of your ear that does hearing. Yeah, it's with those sound waves. So we, we started with the cochlear part of this nerve. The part that we see over here that's actually attaching to these chambers over here, that's the vestibulo part. So these structures that we outlined over here, the saccule, the utricle, the semicircular canal, technically as a group, we can call them the vestibule. <clears throat> the vestibule. So you'll see that terminology in, in the guided lesson. The vestibule includes the saccule and the utricle, which are two big sacs that I see right here. And then it's connected to these semicircular canals that, that branch out from it. Now, I'll mention for you, before we move on and start talking about how these, these balance processes work, when I'm looking here at the semicircular canals, notice that I have this one I just traced called the lateral semicircular canal. Then we got the one back here called the posterior semicircular canal. And then finally, the anterior semicircular canal. These semicircular canals help us to do dynamic equilibrium which is the rotational equilibrium. For you to precisely determine how your body's rotating or determine how your head's rotating, that's the job of the semicircular canals. So I have three of them to help me know exactly how I'm rotating. When we talk about whether I'm going forward or backwards, that's what static equilibrium is, forward or backwards. I, I just have two, two sacs that, that do that for me. I don't have to be quite as precise as I do with, with rotational equilibrium. So just a heads up, the reason I have three of these is because I have to so precisely figure out exactly how I'm rotating or how fast I'm rotating or which direction, all of that stuff there. I promise, though, on the exam, I'm not going to ask you the name of a particular semicircular canal. So... You don't have to know the specific names of them, but do know that these little rabbit ears or whatever we want to call them coming off over here, those are those semicircular canals. All right, so let's start with the kind of equilibrium that I do in the utricle and the saccule, in the two big sacs. Help me out here. The utricle and the saccule, did they do static equilibrium or dynamic equilibrium? The utricle and the saccule, which of those two kinds of equilibrium did we say these ones did? Yeah, these are the places that I do static equilibrium. Static equilibrium. By the way, one of the best ways to remember what static equilibrium looks like is the two ways that you could fall asleep in class. I know that you would never fall asleep <clears throat> in my class, right? Although, man, sometimes those 7.30 labs, they, they, they were pretty early, pretty intense. So static equilibrium helps you to know if here's, here's the normal way most people fall asleep in class, right? They, they do a little bit of this. Where their head kind of goes forward and they, they catch it and they get it back up, right? So sometimes I see a lot of that, that kind of, your static equilibrium is telling you, oh, your head's going forward. I got to jerk it back up. Got to get upright again. But man, you know, you can also fall asleep in class if you were just completely wiped, right? We've got that falling asleep in class where your head goes all the way back, right? And usually if your head goes all the way back, you're snoring, right? And your neighbors are like, oh my gosh, like you literally just fell asleep in class. Like, so static equilibrium, the two ways you could fall asleep in class, your head could go forward and you fall asleep or your head could go backwards and you could just pass out for days. That's what static equilibrium is, is designed to help prevent for you, to make sure you don't fall asleep in class. So the two places that help you not fall asleep in class, make sure your head doesn't go forward or backwards in class, are called the utricle and the saccule. So inside the utricle and the saccule, I have a membrane called the macula. That's one of our first underlying highlight star structures, the macula. So what you're looking at right here, this line of cells, all of this is what I call the macula. So inside the utricle and the saccule, inside these two fluid-filled sacs that we saw in our other picture, and we see them here, 
I have a special nervous tissue membrane called the macula. The macula is made out of hair cells. Hair cells. <clears throat> Here's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. The types of cells that detect sound waves are also called hair cells. So hearing and static equilibrium both use hair cells. Hair cells have hairs that stick out on top of them. That's how they get their names, right? So here's the hairs. I see them sticking out above these hair cells. These hairs stick out into this big blue jello thing that I see right here. By the way, you'll notice when you're doing this guiding, guided lesson, apparently I just like love jello and I can't make any comparisons besides to it. Um, I don't know, let me ask the chat, does anybody else actually eat jello or is it just Dr. Aulis? I, ha I have this thing for purple jello. I know a lot of you are probably like groans purple. I love, no, actually it's not just pregnancy talking. It's like, like, all the time I would totally eat jello. I grew up with this kind of, of jello where we put um, Cool Whip inside of it when it's setting up, and then it makes this really awesome like creamy layer with jello and Cool Whip inside. It's it's legit. Um, but I, I'm I'm noticing that not very many people in the chat actually eat jello. So y'all think I'm really weird. We can pretend it's the pregnancy talking, but I I totally would eat layered jello all the time. So just saying. Um, I got this jello layer right here. This this jello layer that's squishy that can move, kind of like jello can move. Um, this this jello layer is called the autolithic membrane. So embedded inside this jello layer are these little extensions coming off of my hair cells. But perhaps what's more important than the autolithic membrane are the little autoliths that live on top. The autoliths, that is an underlying highlight star. We got to know those for, for static equilibrium. <clears throat> autoliths are really little crystals or little rocks, basically, that are inside your ear. These little rocks move depending on, on where your head is relative to gravity. So gravity is constantly pulling on these little rocks that live in your ear. They can slide forward and they can slide backwards. When they slide, this jello that they're resting on top of, the autolithic membrane, uh, when they start moving, they pull their jello with them. And when they pull their jello with them, these little hairs that were embedded inside of it, they start to bend and move as well. So, static equilibrium, some structures that we definitely need to know. We need to know that this occurs in the utricle and the saccule. This is where I do this process. We need to know that inside the utricle and the saccule, we have this membrane called the macula. The macula is where I find all of those hair cells. Hair cells. I think about my hair cells just like they were with hearing. Um, these are what actually detects movements, detects equilibrium for me. Those hair cells are, are going to be bumped or we're going to see that, that they'll, they'll change their shape just like they did before because of the autoliths. Autoliths. And here's a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I do love the autoliths. They have a fun name. They look really cool to me. I'm like 95% certain you will have a question on your exam about autoliths just because they're my favorite. So make sure we know that autoliths are involved in static equilibrium. Make sure we know that they're, they're going to mess with my hair cells. The direction is the opposite from up to down compared to hearing. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I think you're talking about signals. We can go ahead and move into signals, talking, talking about signaling here. So here's overview for you of, of the structures that are involved in static equilibrium. So let's go to how this process actually works. Okay, so we are looking at, at the three ways that you could move your head. The three way states it could be duress. Hopefully for most of us right now, we're in this state right here. Our head is upright, we're alert, we're not falling asleep. Then we've got the, I'm falling asleep in class, my head's going forward. 
Then we've got the I'm, I'm completely passing out in class. My head's going backwards. So we've got three states going on here. I think what Pilar was getting at for us here, the detection. Oh, I can't hit that C. The detection of static equilibrium is all about the rate of neurotransmitter release. That is a message that we also said with hearing, right? So static equilibrium, just like the process of hearing, it's all about the rate that neurotransmitters are released. So let's go through and look at the different rates that we release them. First state, your head is upright, you're awake in class. When my head is upright and I'm awake in class, gravity is pulling straight down on my autolysts. So all of these little rocks right here, they're resting top of the membrane straight on top of these hair cells. Here's the little hair cells, right? Here's one right here. I can see one right here. When those autoliths rest right on top of the hair cells, I open up a few mechanically gated potassium channels. A few mechanically gated potassium channels, which means that I'm going to let in a little bit of potassium, which means I'm going to let in a little bit of calcium, which means I'm going to make a, a low number, or the way they describe it right here, is just a steady, slow stream of signals. So imagine uh, like a little babbling brook that's going through the woods. Right now, I could definitely use a hike past a little babbling brook in the woods. Um, so imagine that there's just a, a constant little level of water or a little level of neurotransmitters that are being spit out. This is because just a few of those mechanically gated channels are being pushed open, just like the case was when we were listening for something and didn't hear anything. So my rate of neurotransmitter release, neurotransmitter release, we might call it slow and steady, slow and steady. When your head is balanced and you're upright, just a very slow and steady rate of neurotransmitters released, which leads to these action potentials, these messages that are slow and steady. Say that you start to get tired. It happens to all of us, right? We're up late studying. We start to do the nodding forward thing. When we start nodding forward, now the force of gravity starts to pull those auto lift forward. So these little rocks that used to be just pushing straight down, now they're being pulled forward. As they get pulled forward, we start to bend those hairs. So we're bending those hairs. We bend those hairs, which means we could say a lot of, a lot of those mechanically gated, I'm gonna abbreviate here, mechanically gated potassium channels open. If a lot of them open, we depolarize the membrane. And if we depolarize the membrane completely, we bring in a ton of calcium, which allows me to make all of these little messages. So when I'm talking about my head going forward, as I'm, I'm losing my balance toward the front, my neurotransmitter release, we might call it a flood. We've got a flood of neurotransmitters. We spit out a ton of them. Because when these autoliths, when these little rocks start pulling on the hairs up here, we bend them and we open up all of the potassium channels. We completely depolarize. So we bring in all of the calcium, which causes me to spit out all of the neurotransmitters. So when I am bending my head forward, we get a ton of messages. When my head is upright, it's kind of the slow and steady messages stuff. When my head starts tilting backwards, gravity is pulling those rocks in the other direction. Now the rocks are getting pulled backwards. And when they get pulled backwards, this is when we start to do what we were talking about before with the hair cells. We actually start to, to push our gates closed. So uh, most, we'll say most, mechanically gated potassium channels close. 
not all of them, but a lot of them were pushing that gate closed on them. I push that gate closed, which means I can't really depolarize my membrane, which means I can't really bring in calcium, which ultimately means that my rate of neurotransmitter release, very low. Very low level of neurotransmitters released. Look at my very low level of signals here. My brain will interpret that as I'm, I'm bending backwards because I'm not getting very many messages compared to the normal level of messages that I got. If I send out a bunch of messages, my brain interprets that as my head going forward. So again, just like with hearing, here's our big underlying highlight star idea. It's all about the rate that those neurotransmitters are released. Are we spitting out a lot? Are we spitting out a few? Are we spitting out like none? Not like none in the way that hearing was, but much fewer. That's how we figure out what's going on with balance. Help me out with static equilibrium. Thumbs up, thumbs down. What questions do we have right now about static equilibrium? Like I said, also known as the two ways you fall asleep in class. I got a thumbs up. Uh, Pilar asked about the word kenocilium. Um, so you'll see you'll see a lot of things. We, we saw this with hearing. They called it the stereocilium. Um, they, we got that word kenocilium. These are all fancy words for the tallest hair the tallest hair on a hair cell. So um, the kenocilium, let me get my pointer back here. The kenocilium is the tallest hair on the hair cells that are involved in equilibrium. The stereocilium is the tallest hair on the hair cells involved in hearing. I'm not going to ask you specifically whether we're bending toward or away from that, that tallest hair. Um, just know that we're bending and know that I've got hairs on all of them, I, I'm not gonna ask you this specific terminology, stereocilium versus kenocilium. But yeah, that's what, the, that's what that word means. It basically means the tallest of the hairs. The, the hair cells, if you remember from our picture, um, they are what it would look like if we decided to start cutting our hairs, our hair in lockdown, right? So you think yourself awesome bangs, and then like you look when you're done, and you're like, oh my gosh, this section is way too long, and this section is way too short. That's that's what's going on with the hair cells. They did a really bad job cutting their hair. So here's that stereocilium or that kenocilium up here. Here is the rest of the hairs that will bend based on what's going on with this guy up here. Yeah. Okay, so that's the process of static equilibrium. That's relative to gravity or when your head goes forward and backwards. The other kind of equilibrium we do is dynamic equilibrium. So let's make a list for ourselves here. Dynamic equilibrium. That's what we're talking about now. Remember that dynamic equilibrium was detected in each of these three tubes that we had here called the semicircular canals. So each of these semicircular canals is filled with fluid. Hey, I didn't mention this before, but this might be a good note to make for yourself. Right here, inside the, the semicircular canals, semicircular canals, I'm going to abbreviate here, semicircular canals are filled with endolymph. So are the utricle and the saccule are filled with endolymph. This mirrors, because remember, endolymph fluid had those cations that we talked about. I'll make sure we know which ones. What are the two cations that endolymph fluid has a lot of inside of it? What are those two positive things that endolymph fluid has inside of it? Ariel remembers. 
some of us are still remembering. Yep, it, it's the potassium and the calcium. For my, my processes of balance and hearing, the places where I actually perceive sensations, so um, inside the utricle and the saccule, where I'm doing static equilibrium, inside the semicircular canals, where I'm doing dynamic equilibrium, and inside the cochlear duct is filled with endolymph. The places where I actually perceive these sound waves or the balance sensations, they're always filled with endolymph fluid. Places where I don't perceive those sound waves, remember like the scala tympani and the scala vestibuli, those had perilymph fluid. So a difference in the kind of fluids that I find in various places. I see endolymph fluid here inside my ear when I am I'm doing the process of dynamic equilibrium. I see endolymph fluid inside the saccule and the utricle when I'm, I'm doing the process of um, static equilibrium. So endolymph fluid involved in both kinds of equilibrium. So dynamic equilibrium is detected technically in the semicircular canals. That's the name of the whole structure that this detection occurs inside of. Specifically, inside those semicircular canals, we have a membrane that we see labeled right here called the crista. So you can see the crista highlighted in purple right here. Each of my semicircular canals has a crista. It has this membrane. When I zoom in up close, this is what the crista looks like. Notice that the crista is a membrane made of hair cells. I told you this on Wednesday. We're going to see a whole lot of hair cells. So here's my hair cells. My hair cells have those hairs sticking out from them. All these little hairs that I see sticking out from the hair cells in all of these places here. All these little hairs extend up into a membrane called the cupula. The cupula. This is a lot like the macula that we talked about with, with static equilibrium. So when I'm talking about dynamic equilibrium, we use a membrane called the crista. The crista is where the hair cells live. And on top of the crista is, here's where my jello comes back, right? Jello-like cupula. A jello-like membrane called the cupula. The cupula is what's actually going to move or bend when you're rotating. So my hair cells down here in the crista, they send up their little hairs into this jello-like membrane called the cupula. And the cupula is going to bend forwards or backwards depending on which direction you're rotating. So just like we did with static equilibrium, make sure we know that each of these structures are involved in dynamic equilibrium. I can't remember for certain, but I'm feeling fairly confident that you've got one of those identify all the structures involved in dynamic equilibrium. I'm pretty sure you got one of those questions on your homework assignment. So make sure lists like this really helpful for you to, to answer questions like that. What kind of structures are involved in dynamic equilibrium? Here's how dynamic equilibrium works. And it's going to be the exact same in the note that we made for hearing and that we made for static equilibrium is going to be exactly the same. Dynamic equilibrium is perceived or detected, can't remember what word I used, based on the rate that neurotransmitters are released. Again, it comes down to the rate. It's all about the rate. So let's start here. We are at rest. We've got an ice skater friend here. She's just gone out onto the ice. She's not started her routine yet. When we are not rotating, notice that the cupula stands straight up. 
the cupula is surrounded by endolymph fluid. So there's fluid all around it. When you are not rotating your head or your body side to side, that fluid stays put. It's not going anywhere. When you start spinning, like we see in the second frame right here, when we start spinning, the fluid inside your ears starts to move with, with your rotation. So notice that the fluid starts to move. We can see our little arrows here that are pushing that fluid around. As that fluid gets pushed around, this flexible jello membrane in the middle here, the cupula, starts to bend with it. So when the cupula is, is bending, we push open those mechanically gated potassium channels. <clears throat> so when we're in the process of rotating, mechanically gated potassium channels all open, all open. We're pushing open that gate. <coughs> Excuse me. So we've pushed open the gate. In rushes all of that potassium, which causes me to rush in all of the calcium, which causes me to send out all the neurotransmitters. When you are actively rotating, we're spitting out all the neurotransmitters. When you stop rotating, like we see in the last picture here, the fluid inside your ears, because of the physics idea of inertia, where something that, that's moving will keep moving until it, it encounters enough resistance, that fluid in your ear continues to spin even though your, your body isn't spinning any longer. So as that fluid continues to spin around, it actually pushes the cupula the other direction because your body stopped moving with it. So we see the, the fluid, it actually looks like it's traveling the other direction because you've stopped spinning with it. We're no longer matching the way that it moves. Because of that, we push our cupula the other direction. And when we push it the other direction, mechanically gated potassium channels close. We push them closed and when they get pushed closed we don't re we don't release the neurotransmitters there's no signals that are being being detected so we don't release neurotransmitters when we've just finished spinning kind of like when we just finished hearing something we stop spitting out neurotransmitters when we're spinning we spit out all the neurotransmitters when we are, are at normal, we haven't spun for a while, we'll spit out just a few neurotransmitters. When we're straight up, just a few of those channels are open. So they're all closed when we're going opposite. They're all open when we're in rotation or just a few of them are open like we see, we see here at the beginning. This would be a, a, a good time to mention for you, I probably won't, won't build the whole chart with us here, um, but this would be a time where we want to compare and contrast these rates of neurotransmitters that are being released. So make a note for yourself when you're doing your studying. We need to compare the rate of neurotransmitter release for each of the things that we talked about. So each of the cases for hearing. When I am listening, when I'm perceiving something, and when it just finished. We want to compare that for hearing. We want to compare that for static equilibrium. The states that we're comparing are head up, head forward, and head backward. And here for dynamic equilibrium, we want to compare when we're still, so when we're not spinning, when we are rotating, and when we finished, finished rotating. I am fairly confident that I actually made you guys outline this in your notes packets. So I think you already have an activity that makes you try to think in these ways. But in case I didn't, please make sure we, we compare for each of these conditions um, how much neurotransmitters are being released 
in each of these different states because the processes of hearing and balance are so similar to each other and it all comes down to um, the rate that I release those neurotransmitters. Uh, so we've got a question when a neuron is at rest, um, is it less neurotransmitters being released? Um, it, it's less neurotransmitters being released than when we're spinning, yes. Uh, the least neurotransmitters are being released when we stop spinning to help our brain know that we've just stopped spinning. Um, I have a normal low level, kind of like we talked about before, slow and steady when I'm upright. Um, I have a slow and steady level of, of neurotransmitter release. Got a whole bunch over here and very little at, at this point. Yeah, so it, it, this, this would be the least when there's the least amount of neurotransmitters to help my brain know, okay, we've stopped moving this direction. What other questions do we have about dynamic equilibrium? Well, I'm not getting any other questions. Let me confirm, I think, yeah, I think with that, we get to move into our last two senses. That'll be super fast, which is awesome. Okay, well, I'm gonna move on to talking about taste and smell. Uh, the question is which nerve again, let me put that to the, to the class. This kind of information here, that, that we're talking about with dynamic equilibrium. Which cranial nerve de detects this? That's half of its name, pilar. Yep, half of its name is, is vestibular. It's the really long name one, right? So, so the, the full name of the nerve that this is all sending its information through is the, yep, the big long one that she typed for us here, vestibulocochlear. Since this is a balance, activity, we're sending our information through the vestibular part. When we talked about hearing, we were sending it through the cochlear part. Um, wink, wink, nudge, nudge for you. Yes, we do need to know the cranial nerves that do each of these types of special sensations. And we outlined that in office hours. Um, I can't remember if that was Wednesday or if it was Tuesday, I think it was Wednesday, that we did the cranial nerves, do make sure you know what cranial nerves do each of these special senses. That will be, will be something I can guarantee will be on the exam. So the vestibulocochlear nerve, that's cranial nerve. Again, I'm gonna ask the same question. What number is vestibulocochlear? Yes, cranial nerve number eight, cranial nerve number eight. So make sure we know that both hearing cochlear part and balance the vestibular part both of those go through cranial nerve number eight make sure we know that yeah let's do our next special sense sense of smell since we're talking cranial nerves here which cranial nerve does the sense of smell let's start with cranial nerves yeah that's cranial nerve number one so cranial nerve number one its name, yep, as, as Emily gave us and Letty gave us, is olfactory. Olfactory, cranial nerve number one. The technical name for the sense of smell is olfaction. Olfaction, sense of smell. There are some ways that the sense of smell is similar to um, the, the senses we just talked about. The, the one way that the sense of smell is similar to equilibrium or to hearing is in the type of cells that it uses. Notice that these cells have olfactory cilia on them, or the way I'm going to refer to it in the guided lesson is olfactory hairs. Cilia could also be called hairs. So they have labeled on, on the picture here, they're calling it an olfactory sensory neuron. Well, it's an olfactory sensory neuron with hairs, 
we're going to call them olfactory hair cells. Olfactory hair cells. So here's another special sense that uses hair cells. They have those hairs. Now, to be fair, these cells look a little bit different than the hair cells we saw before, but here's all their little hairs down here at the bottom. You can see their little hairs down here at the bottom. So the sense of hearing, the sense of balance, and now the sense of smell, all of those use hair cells. The sense of smell is done by this little section inside your nasal cavity called the olfactory epithelium. So literally this olfactory epithelium is about a one square inch space. Everything that you smell is all processed through this little one square inch space inside your nose. So when we zoom in on that olfactory epithelium, that place where we do the process of smell, we see a couple of types of cells there. Let me zoom in. The first kind of cells is the ones that we talked about here. So all my little yellow ones here, these are the olfactory hair cells the ones that actually do the process of smell. <coughs> we also see around these cells supporting cells, and these supporting cells are there to support the hair cells. So their goal is to help keep these hair cells alive, help keep them protected. Um, if my, hair, my olfactory hair cell happens to die, which it, it does happen, um, these cells can actually help to replicate and, and change into a hair cell. So they're there to support the cells. Generally, they don't do smelling on their own. They could help us to, to replicate hair cells so that we could detect stimuli. Another really important thing, though, that's in the olfactory epithelium is this gland that we have labeled right here. So the gland that we see labeled, here it is in my picture, this gland spits out my favorite thing right now, which is mucus. I got all the mucus in the world for you. Um, so here's the mucus down here. Mucus lives on top of the olfactory epithelium. Mucus is uh, where I find those olfactory hairs, the, the places that help me out with the process of, of smelling. So there is actually an, a, a physiological purpose for mucus in your nose. The purpose of that mucus is for us to suspend these olfactory hairs. The other purpose of that mucus, though, is to dissolve. Air. So the special, special things that you smell are called odorants. It's a fun word. The thing you actually smell are called odorants. So the job of mucus is to dissolve. It catches and then it dissolves those odorants. Now, when we talk about the process of smell, and also when we talk about the process of taste, smell and taste are what we call chemical senses. Chemical senses means two things. The first thing it means is that what you're detecting are chemicals. The second thing that it means, though, is that those chemicals have to be dissolved for you to be able to detect them. In other words, I've got to catch those odorants in mucus. When I catch them in mucus, that activates these hairs on, on the hair cells. When those little dissolved chemicals get up and they, they bounce into or they attach to the olfactory hairs. Okay, this question is going to sound scarier than it actually is. I promise it's not that scary. Here's the question. On these olfactory hairs, whose job it is to detect odorants, odorants bump into them and attach to them and lead to the opening of channels. Which kind of gated channels would I find on olfactory hairs? If odorants open them up, what kind of gated channels do these have? Yeah, so, so a few of us are, are being brave and we're thinking about it and we're absolutely right. Olfactory hairs have chemically 
gated channels. Olfactory hairs have chemically gated channels. That is a difference from the hairs that we saw in equilibrium and balance. But the way that you can remember that they have chemically gated channels is what they're detecting is chemicals. I literally dissolve the chemicals to be able to detect them. And I have to dissolve them so that they can be a key to open up my chemically gated channel. So the way you do the process of smell is my chemicals go up, they touch, uh, once they're dissolved in mucus, they go up and they touch the olfactory hairs. The olfactory hairs have a key, or have a gate, excuse me, that that chemical is the key for. I will activate that neuron based on the fact that I just put the right key in the lock. So when I do the process of smell, each of these different olfactory hair cells, each of them are gonna be activated by different kinds of chemicals. So unlike when we, were, when we were talking about the process of hearing or when we were talking about um, the processes of balance, how we kind of activated all the hair cells at once or none of the hair cells, when you do the process of smell, um, I believe the number, I, I might quote this wrong, I know it's in one of the videos you're watching, I think it's something like you can do 40,000 different smells. Um, that's because we have so many different olfactory hair cells that each get activated by different smells or different chemicals, different odorants, and your brain can process those to smell different things. So um, we don't activate all the olfactory hair cells in your nose at once because they're all activated by special chemicals. That's how we can perceive the difference in, in smells. And Pilar is absolutely right. My other chemical sense is the sensation of, of taste. So taste is going to be the same way. It's going to be these chemically gated channels again. So it's no longer mechanically gated. It's, no, it's not voltage gated. It's just chemically gated channels. Yeah, so Letty asked a great question, and it's a question that I, had a, I wish I had a better answer for. Um, you guys have probably heard about and read that um, one of the signs of COVID-19 can be a loss of smell and taste. Um, I wish I had an answer, Letty, for exactly why COVID-19 uh, or how COVID-19 causes that loss of, of smell and taste. I, I Last time I checked, which to be fair was a little while ago because I've been just a little busy. Um, last time I checked, there wasn't a great answer as to exactly how it works. My hypothesis would be that the virus actually replicates inside of these olfactory hair cells and causes them to die. Um, that would be my guess, but don't quote me on that as, as it being true because I definitely don't have scientific research that backs it up. Um, I wish I did because I know that that would be a really awesome current events article <clears throat> to explain why we can't, we can't smell and taste with, uh, with COVID-19. <clears throat> Sorry. I think we just don't have quite enough research to understand that yet, though. Uh, but that's a great correlation to make. It has something to do with either the cilia or the mucus or the cells themselves. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know. So if, if one of you guys comes across an article that tries to explain it, let me know. Pass it along because I, I would love to know that. So the correlation I ask you guys to make in your notes <clears throat> about the loss of sense of smell was not COVID-19, um, but it was actually if someone has a cold um, or if you're like Dr. Aulis and you have a sinus infection. <laughs> when you have a cold or when you have a sinus infection, what might explain why you can't smell anymore? Any ideas of what happens when you have a cold or a sinus infection that makes it hard to smell? Can we, can we hypothesize together? Okay, so Ariel's thinking about, um, Ariel and Emily are thinking about maybe swelling. Um, that could be part of it. Swelling brings brings extra blood. Um, extra blood would help us to make 
um, make extra of something, what do you make a lot of when you when you have a cold? Why does Dr. Alice keep needing her tissues? Why do I gotta have my tissues? Yeah, I I have to have my tissues <clears throat> because I have way too much mucus right now. Let's go back to our picture. Here I'm looking at the olfactory epithelium where the, the hair cells live, the ones that detect odorants. I wanna have enough mucus to catch the odorant and then for it to go and bump into my hairs pretty quickly. If I have a cold, or here, we'll, we'll be a little nasty here. If I got the sinus infection that Dr. Aulis has going on, we got some green mucus down here. Actually, we have all the green mucus down here. My odorants come in, and they attach to the bottom part of this mucus here. They're going to move through the mucus using the process of diffusion to tie back into to unit one. Diffusion is where they just randomly go where there's not a lot of them, right? If I have all of this mucus down here, some of those odorants that I'm smelling are gonna bounce off to the side and they'll never bump into an olfactory hair. Compared to if I just have this little layer of mucus here, the perfect, perfect layer of mucus right here, those odorants come in, they attach to it, and there's hairs all over the place. They're gonna bump into them. So all of that extra mucus, when you have a cold or when you have a sinus infection, think of it kind of like we're diluting everything that you smell. So everything that comes in, it's got all of this extra space that it has to bounce through to be able to get all the way up to the olfactory hairs. So short answer of why you can't smell when you have a cold is because you have too much mucus. Anything you're trying to smell we probably are never getting that to those olfactory hairs. So I also, I always like to share this, this life hack that I have. Um, if you are ever suffering from a cold, which obviously you guys never get sick, right? We're, we're definitely not going to get sick because we're stressed at the end of the semester. When you have your end of semester sickness, unless that's just me, um, and you start to make a whole lot of mucus, if you really badly want to taste or smell something, if you blow your nose and then take a bite really fast, for a split second, you might be able to taste it. Um, that's because we got rid of some of this extra mucus here. If I literally blow that out of my nose and there's just the right level of mucus that's left, for a split second before all that other mucus comes into its place and, and covers it back up and dilutes everything again, um, for a split second, you might be able to smell or taste. So um, there, there's my life hack for you. Get rid of some of that extra mucus, and for a moment, you can enjoy the little things in life. So there we go. All right. Brings us to the sense of taste. This is as close as we get to my favorite system this semester. Alas. Help me out in the chat. What's my favorite system? Which one do we not get to talk about this semester? Digestive, yep, digestive system. So uh, as close as we get to the digestive system together is at least talking about how you taste things. So um, taste is much more related to smell than what you actually detect um, with your tongue, with your, your taste buds. Um, but we will talk about how taste works. Taste and smell, by the way, work pretty much the same. So it, it's great. When we talk about the process of taste, I have, they're labeled here as gustatory epithelial cells. But those gustatory epithelial cells have hairs on top of them. They have hairs on top of them, which means we can call them gustatory hair cells. Gustatory hair cells. Another special sense that uses hair cells. Imagine that. Okay, so these hair cells have these little tiny hairs at the top of them. These little tiny hairs detect the chemicals in your food. So, uh, by the way, let's see if we can, can help me out in the chat here. What's the technical name for the process of taste? What's the fancy anatomy name for taste? Anybody know?
That's okay. This is the very end of the packet. We didn't quite get there. A couple of us got there. Okay. The town name for taste is Gustation. Gustation. When you see that word Gustation, uh, that, that means taste. So when we talk about Gustation, Gustation is another example of a chemical sense. Chemical sense. So it means the exact same thing that it meant when we were talking about smell. It means that I'm detecting chemicals. The name of the chemicals that you're detecting in gustation, they're called tastants. Tastants. Tastants have to be dissolved for you to be able to detect them, just like odorants had to be dissolved. <clears throat> what do you have inside your mouth? that would help you to dissolve tastants. What's in your mouth? Hopefully not mucus, right? Yeah, exactly, saliva. We've got saliva in the mouth. The job of saliva from an anatomy perspective is to help you to dissolve tastants. So tastants are the chemicals that we detect when we're tasting something. They have to be dissolved in saliva because when I dissolve them in saliva out here on the tongue surface, then that saliva goes down into these little tiny holes where it'll bump into those hairs on top of my gustatory hair cells. <clears throat> Tastins are chemicals, and those chemicals activate my gustatory hair cells. Which kind of ion channels are found on gustatory hairs? What kind of ions, channels, are found on gustatory hair cells if my tastants open them? Yeah, we're, we're back to the same thing that we saw with smell, right? We're back to the same thing we saw with smell, which is those chemically gated channels. Those chemically gated channels. Again, this is a way they're similar to each other. I told you taste and smell very similar to each other. So chemically gated channels on the top of the gustatory hair cells that I see here. When you uh, look inside, what we're looking at right here is a picture of a taste bud. Taste buds live all over your tongue. <clears throat> inside the taste buds, we have a whole lot of... <clears throat> So sorry, guys. A whole lot of gustatory hair cells. But we also have a lot of these basal cells. Basal cells don't detect taste sensations. But if gustatory hair cells die, basal cells can divide and develop into a gustatory hair cell. We're really grateful for basal, basal cells in the taste buds. When we drink coffee that's a little too hot, and we burn our tongue and we lose taste sensation for, for a few days. It being just a few days is because of these basal cells. If we didn't have basal cells, we couldn't make new gustatory hair cells and then we wouldn't be able to taste anymore. And actually that's what happens with, uh, with aging. Um, we start to see that these basal cells aren't as great at replicating, so the sense of taste actually declines because the number of, of gustatory hair cells goes down. So here's a taste bud with those gustatory hair cells that actually detect taste sensations. When you look in the mirror at your tongue, any bumps that you see aren't directly taste buds. Um, they're actually things that are called papillae. So this papillae word means bumps. The bumps on your tongue are papillae. So most of your tongue, the space on your tongue, is covered in what we call fungiform papillae. If you look at them really up close, they look like a mushroom. That's why they're called fungiform. These fungiform papillae tend to have about three to five taste buds per bump, so per papilla. The very back of your tongue, you probably can't see them, are these big guys back here. They're called the valate papillae, and the way I like to remember them is they make the letter V on the back of the tongue back here, valate papillae. Valate papillae have a ton of taste buds. Lots of taste buds. I'm going to get my numbers wrong here. Um, 
I want to guess it's in the ballpark of, I don't know if anyone has it in their notes yet. Isn't it like 30 to 40 or something? I, I can't remember. So don't quote my numbers. My numbers might be wrong. It says 50. Okay, there we go. So they got like 50. I couldn't remember my exact numbers on that. Yeah, so we got about 50 taste buds in each of these little tiny bumps back here. Well, actually, they're not tiny. They're really big. Um, each of these bumps here in the back of your tongue have 50 taste buds on them. Not nearly as many taste buds on the front part of the tongue, but tons of taste buds in, in each of these bumps here along the back. These bumps back here actually also detect taste sensations too. So the very top of, uh, well, I guess it's technically the very bottom and back of your tongue also has taste buds that collect information. Um, but lots of, of taste buds scattered throughout in these little small bumps. Many, many taste buds concentrated in these ones. Does anyone happen to remember from working on your notes and watching the videos, what's special about these little foliate ones here on the side? There was something pretty cool about the foliate papillae on the side of the tongue. Did anyone happen to catch that? Yeah, foliate papillae are a special kind of bump that have taste buds in them, but only in children. So there's not, in all of us, our, our ridges on the side of our tongue aren't going to have taste buds anymore. But in children, these foliate papillae on the sides actually have taste buds in them too. So I made the little joke for you in that guided lesson that maybe this is why children don't eat vegetables, right? We'll try to give them a pass. They, they have a special set of, of taste buds that us adults don't have. So maybe vegetables just taste completely different to them. Or kids are just stubborn. That That's my my kids kids problem. Yeah, only mac and cheese. Yep, for her it is it is mac and cheese and a particular brand of chicken nugget. Uh, we, we bought a different kind. She likes the ones that we get at Sam's. We bought some from Aldi the other week. She refuses to eat them. Like, it has to be the Sam's chicken nuggets. So... I'm going to blame her foliate papillae. Oh, well, we, she's just, her, her palate is just too refined for us, I guess. So let me see what I have left in here. Yeah, it's just blank. Okay. Um, I'm not going to take class time to talk to you guys about the five taste sensations because you've got a really great description of those. Um, when we talk about the process of taste, since it's a chemical sense, it, uh, how you process tasting different things is based on what kind of chemicals are in the food you're eating. So if you're eating something that has a lot of um, organic substances in it, so this is things like alcohols or sugar, um, that's going to register with your taste buds as the sweet taste sensation. Uh, but then there's also different chemicals. Uh, for example, if there's if it's really acidic, what you're eating, um, something like vinegar, for example, is is acetic acid. Um, if something's really acidic, that's going to register as a sour intense sensation on your tongue. So there's a little bit of food physiology there for you uh, to think about why things taste differently. Um, so I'll leave that to you because I ended on a really fun note. So I don't want to ruin that for you. Um, question in the chat is, can you help with how the taste buds are different from papillae? Yeah, so um, the papillae are, are bumps. That's what, what their name means, is that they're a bump. The taste buds are inside those bumps. So let me do a really crude drawing here of a fungiform papillae. Looks like, if I'm looking at it from the side, so all of these little bumps you see on the tongue, if I zoomed really close on each of these bumps, this is what it would look like from the side. Um, ooh, I can draw circles. Okay. Dr. Aulis is learning new things right here. Well, that's too big. Imagine that uh, inside of these papillae then, or on top of and around these papillae, you find those little circles like you see in the picture. So papillae are actually the bumps themselves see on the tongue the taste buds are embedded inside of those papillae so taste buds are much smaller than the bumps that are on the tongue they're inside of them yeah you're welcome any other questions about taste
as you may be typing questions, I want to, like I promised, bring up a whiteboard to talk to you guys about next week. Next week. Yeah, that sounds about right. Next week. Hey, remind me, what's the first thing for anatomy next week? What's the big thing in our class next week? What did I tell you is going live on Monday? Yep, exam number four. Exam number four. Exam number four covers lessons 12 and 13. Lessons 12 and 13, spinal cord and special senses. So this exam opens Monday at 9.30 a.m. It closes Wednesday at, <coughs> excuse me, 11, wow, 1559, nope, 1159 p.m. <coughs> um, yes, yeah, so Emily asked if we're going to have review. So on, for, for Monday and Tuesday, office hours is going to be review for exam four. I suspect there is a chance that we will not need four hours to review for exam four. I'll be available for all four hours. I don't think there's enough content for us to do that. Um, but Monday and Tuesday's office hours will be review for this exam. Um, so Monday through Wednesday, at some point next week, we need to plan to take that exam covering lessons two and three, uh, or 12 and 13. Oh my goodness, two and three. Um, does anyone know when lesson number 13 homework is due? When is lesson number 13 homework due? Has anyone seen that yet? Oh, you guys think I'm meaner than I am. I knew that it's a busy time of the semester. I'm giving you a little bit of an extension. It is due by Tuesday at 11.59 p.m. Now, I think you're better off getting it done before Tuesday. Um, I think it would be good for you to, to plan to take your exam before Wednesday. If you can't take it till Wednesday, I get it, that's fine. Um, I set the due date for Tuesday on that homework assignment in case you're planning to take the exam on Wednesday. So um, remember, just like normal, we've got unlimited attempts. So use those attempts between now and Tuesday to get um, that special census information knocked out and practice and all that kind of stuff. Um, and again, we got to finish up that exam by Wednesday. We have another couple of assignments, actually, I think, due next week. One of the things due next week is current events in anatomy. Current events in anatomy. We have talked about this in office hours before, but let me remind you, you are required to do one submission. Required to do one submission. Uh, you can do up to four submissions total. That would mean you have three extra credit submissions. Legitimately, I can't remember this. Did I set the due date on current events in anatomy? Was that Friday that I set that of next week? Does anyone happen to remember? I think it was May 1st. What is May 1st? That's today. Is it Friday? I believe all of your submissions. Yeah, okay. So all submissions due by Friday at 11.59 p.m. You will submit all of them into the same Dropbox. Um, I've set it to accept four different submissions. So put your best one in there first, because that's the one that I'm going to grade like it's your normal assignment. And then, I mean, we want them all to be good, um, to get extra credit. Um, but yeah, all of them go into the same place. If you are doing more than one submission, we do need to pick topics from more than one unit. So. Uh, when you look at this assignment, it has a list for you of tags to tell you what topics were covered um, for each of those units. You can see those tags when you look at, at the articles that I, I have posted for you. 
So just make sure we find something from every unit in the semester to help you review for your cumulative exam. <coughs> One other thing that is due next week. Does anyone happen to know? I think I said it next week. I think it's set for next Saturday. Unless I'm wrong. Yeah, the group wiki. So last thing that's due next week. Uh, final exam group wiki project. Everyone has been placed in a, a new group for this, this final exam group wiki project. Because the goal of this project is to help you to review stuff from every part of the semester, you will see questions from each unit. Is it due Friday, Pilar? I can't remember. Somebody who's, who's looking at it, I can't remember if it was Friday or Saturday that I said that one is due. Yeah, Pilar doesn't know. I don't know either. Um, it's, it's, I believe it's either Friday or Saturday. So um, why don't we all assume that it's due on Thursday? to make sure we get our contributions in for our group early. Um, let's see if I can pull it up really fast. Oh, my computer's like, we don't do anything fast right now. Checking, checking, let's open this one up. Oh, I was kind, okay. I gave you guys till Sunday, Sunday. Do Sunday, May 3rd, Sunday, May 3rd at 11.59 p.m. Again, let's pretend like the due date is Friday um, to make sure that we get stuff contributed. I do want you to go in and um, as much as possible, I'm trying to encourage collaboration, um, try to divide up the work amongst each other, proofread each other's answers to make sure that they're correct. The goal is that hopefully you don't have to answer all the questions by yourself. Um, so please try to get in touch with, with your group members to see if we can get some of that work divided up. Um, what I will say too, because I know sometimes you get placed in a group that's not great and then you end up having to do more work than, um, than some of your group members. What I will say is I promise it's not a waste of your time. Um, the questions that are on, on that group wiki project literally come from the list of learning objectives for the final exam. So if you're answering those questions, you are preparing yourself for the final exam. So I know it's frustrating if you have to do more work than than your neighbors, um, but I promise it's worthwhile work. It's, it's going to help you on that final exam. Let me change colors to put this in red. Can't believe we're already talking about this, but here we are. Final exam opens. Monday, May 4, 9.30 a.m. And it will close Tuesday, May 5, at 11.59 p.m. Just like with other exams, plan to give yourself um, plenty of time. I would encourage you to try to take it on Monday to get it knocked out. Um, I will do, let's put a little note on here, um, final exam review office hours are going to be next week. So next week, Thursday and Friday. And I'll do one final round of office hours on May 4th. Um, that's the Monday. One final round of office hours to wrap up final exam review. I will get our schedule, um, especially with, with the office hours stuff, so you know what we're doing each day. I'll get that posted for you as soon as possible. Um, but again, the beginning of next week is helping you to wrap up uh, spinal cord and special senses. So again, I'm going to need you to bring content because I got nothing in particular to cover those days. That's Monday, Tuesday. <laughs> Lecture exams got to be done by Wednesday night. Uh, to get you ready for that exam, please do lesson number 13 homework before you take exam four. I think most of us will, um, but please make sure to do that homework before you do lesson or before you do exam number four. Current events in anatomy is Friday. Group wiki is Sunday. And then we're moving into that final exam. So um, 
we are so close to the finish line, guys. Like, don't give up. Keep pressing forward. Um, you're doing awesome. I'm so proud of, of all of you guys for making it to this point in the semester. I know it has not been easy. So super proud of all of you. And I'm here to, to root for you and support you in office hours and via email as, as much as I can. Do we have any questions about this stuff, about our schedule? And I'll make sure that, that our announcement that I post on Sunday outlines it all for you. But any questions um, at this point before I wrap up the recording? <laughs> You're welcome, Pilar. Yeah, I'm, I, I want to support you guys. I know I can't be there in person to, to support you. So, oh, yeah, that sounds good. Letty says, let's have a Cinco de Mayo celebration, right? Because by Cinco de Mayo, you should be done. You will be done, right? By, by 1159, you will be done with our class. So, yeah, wrap it up on the 4th or on the morning of Cinco de Mayo and then have some awesome tacos and drink a margarita on my behalf because there will be no margaritas for me, alas. All right, well, I am going to wrap up uh, the recordings. Uh, goodbye to our friends in the recording. Hope to see you again next week.